Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series, reading Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Without further ado, returning to Frankenstein as read by Lord Naren White. Clairval, who had watched my countenance as I read this letter, was surprised to observe the despair that succeeded the joy I at first expressed on receiving new from my friends. I threw the letter on the table and covered my face with my hands. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed Henry, when he perceived me weep with bitterness. Are you always to be unhappy? My dear friend, what has happened? I motioned him to take up the letter while I walked up and down the room in the extremest agitation. Tears also gushed from the eyes of Clerval as he read the account of my misfortune. I can offer you no consolation, my friend, said he. Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do? To go instantly to Geneva. Come with me, Henry, to order the horses. During our walk, Clerval endeavored to say a few words of consolation. He could only express his heartfelt sympathy. Poor William, said he. Dear love, de de dear lovely child, he now sleeps with his angel mother, who that had seen him bright and joyous in his young beauty but must weep over his untimely loss. To die so miserably, to feel the murderer's grasp. How much more a murder that could destroy radiant innocence. Poor little fellow, one only consolation have we. His friends mourn and weep, but he is at rest. The pang is over. His sufferings are at an end forever. A sod covers his gentle form, and he knows no pain. He can no longer be a subject for pity. We must reserve that for his miserable survivors. Clerval spoke thus as we hurried through the streets. The words impressed themselves on my mind, and I remembered them afterwards in solitude. But now, as soon as the horses arrived, I hurried into a cabriolet and bade farewell to my friend. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, for I longed to console and sympathize with my loved and sorrowing friends. But when I drew near my native town, I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind. I passed through scenes familiar to my youth, but which I had not seen for nearly six years. How altered everything might be during that time. One sudden and desolating change had taken place, but a thousand little circumstances might have by degrees worked other alterations, which, although they were done more tranquilly, might not be the less decisive. Fear overcame me. I dared no advance dreading a thousand nameless evils that made me tremble, although I was unable to define them. I remained two days at Lausanne in this painful state of mind. I contemplated the lake, the waters were placid, all around was calm in the snowy mountains, the palaces of nature were not changed. By degrees the calm and heavenly scene restored me, and I continued my journey towards Geneva. The road ran by the side of the lake, which became narrower as I approached my native town. I discovered more distinctly the black sides of Jura and the bright summit of Mont Blanc. I wept like a child. Dear mountains, my own beautiful lake, how do you welcome your wanderer? Your summits are clear, the sky and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace or to mock at my unhappiness? I 
I fear, my friend, that I shall render myself tedious by dwelling on these preliminary circumstances. But they were the days of comparative happiness, and I think of them with pleasure. My country, my beloved country, who but a native can tell the delight I took in again beholding thy streams, thy mountains, and, more than all, thy lovely lake? Yet, as I drew nearer home, grief and fear again overcame me. Night also closed around, and when I could hardly see the dark mountains, I felt still more gloomily. The picture appeared a vast and dim scene of evil, and I foresaw obscurely that I was destined to become the most wretched of human beings. Alas, I prophesied truly, and failed only in one single circumstance that in all the misery I imagined and dreaded, I did not conceive the hundredth part of the anguish I was destined to endure. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Secheron, a village at the distance of half a lake from the city. The sky was serene, and I was unable to rest. I resolved to visit the spot when my poor William had been murdered. As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plain Palais. During this short voyage, I saw the lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and, on landing, I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced, the heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. I quitted my seat and walked on, although the darkness and storm increased every minute, and the thunder burst with a terrific crash over my head. It was echoed from Salive, the Juras, and the Alps of Savoy, Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. Then, for an instant, everything seemed of a pitchy darkness, until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. The storm, as it is often the case in Switzerland, appeared at once in various parts of the heavens. The most violent storm hung exactly north of the town, over the part of the lake which lies between the promontory of Belrive and the village of Cope. Another storm enlightened Jura with faint flashes, and another darkened and sometimes disclosed the mole, a peaked mountain to the east of the lake. While I watched the tempest so beautiful yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. This noble war in the sky elevated my spirits, I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, my de dear angel, this is thy funeral, this thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me, its gigantic stature, and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy daemon, to whom I had given life. What did he there? Could he be? I shuddered at the conception. The murderer of my brother? No sooner did that idea cross my imagination and I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered, and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly, and I lost it in the gloom. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy it. Please like, comment, <laughs> And subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all.
take care and thanks again.